Well, this morning is a, uh, a church planting update in Papua New Guinea, but it also is kind of a, uh, a ploy to actually get us into the book of Titus as well. So I'm going to give an update, high level, Papua New Guinea, just some things that are going on, and then we're going to dive right into uh, church planting in Papua New Guinea and get into the book of Titus. Uh, just to give you an update and speed, uh, the Cans and the Mitchells, I'm going to assume that everybody knows who they are, which I think everybody does. If you don't, you should leave the auditorium now and then come back in, uh, go over to the missions uh, tablet over there and display board and sign up for the newsletter uh, for the Cans and the Mitchells and for Finisterre, uh, just so you can stay up to date on what's happening with church planting in Papua New Guinea. Uh, that's going to benefit you and just help you. But I'm going to give an update on the Cans and the Mitchells. The Cans and Mitchells just got back from a trip into the village. Uh, their houses uh, collapsed in an earthquake uh, back end of last year, and it's been difficult to get back into the village and be able to make an assessment, and then to start doing the work of tearing down the homes in preparation for doing house building. And so when they went in, this was just last week, they had a goal of one, getting a verbal agreement that they have always had with the people in Maui Roro, written onto paper and signed. Just clarifying uh, the reason why they're in the village, uh, why they build homes, why they're gonna be there long term. And they got that signed with a tremendous amount of smiling faces and signatures. And they also wanted to get the Cans house cleared out with any items that they had in it and move all those items over into the Mitchell's house, which, although it is collapsed, is more secure uh, than the Can house is. And they were able to accomplish all of those goals, uh, even pulling solar panels off of the homes. Um, very encouraging to see their list. Uh, next steps that are in the horizon for them, one, they're going to need to tear down the can house, and so there will be another trip that happens starting at the roof, working their way down all the way to the posts, and taking all those materials and setting them aside in preparation to use them on a house rebuild. Next will be a desire to build a small office, uh, two bedrooms, a mudroom, and a bathroom uh, that will allow them to be able to stay there when they're in the house building process. After that, there'll be the need to empty the Mitchell house of everything that's there, fly items out that the Mitchells will not need, keep anything that is needed there for the cans, and then tear down the Mitchell house all the way down to the posts, all the way down to the concrete. And at that point, it'll be time to rebuild the cans house. And that is when we will need a house building team from the states to be able to go out and help them. And we are already working on building that team. We're looking for three to four very specialized individuals to have a, an extensive background in carpentry, electrical, plumbing, uh, so that we could hand them a set of blueprints and say, can you build this? And they don't need much direction, and they can easily turn and just start working on that project. So we are in the process of doing that. I would ask you just to be praying for them uh, as they have a tremendous amount of work in front of them. And Adding things into this, the cans are actually returning to the United States. They will be here at the back end of this month uh, because Cass has a baby that will be due very soon. And so you will be seeing Zach, no doubt, standing in this pulpit teaching and giving you guys updates personally very soon. So just be praying for them. That is the cans and the Mitchells. On the other side are the Twombleys and uh, the Laymans. So the Twombleys who spent a tremendous amount of time at Grace Bible Church uh, with us here uh, last year in 2022. Uh, they are going to be in Medang and taking up the post of overseeing and stepping into church planting and strengthening, as well as things that are happening in Medang that have always been there, uh, logistical support and administrative work as well. They are going to be the first of, Lord willing, three total families that will be in Medang that are not only involved with overseeing ministry in Medang, but they are also involved in supporting tribal church planters like the Cans um, are presently doing. And updates for them and for us, our family is planning to go with them. We're going to be there for six months. We want to be able to oversee their orientation. We also want to be able to get a picture of where we are as an organization in Papua New Guinea. Where are we at operationally? Where are we at logistically? Where are we at in terms of planning? Not only now, but also over the next five years, wanting to have more church planting teams that are placed throughout the Finisterres, wanting to have a focus of ministry that's developed in Medang, so that we end up eventually cultivating and building up and raising up New Guinean pastors and church planters that are able to go and do the work that present missionaries that are being sent into the village are doing. 
There's a tremendous amount of work left to do. As of right now, uh, two days ago, our work permits were approved to be able to go, which is fantastic. And I uh, found out yesterday that our entry visas have already been lodged. And so, Lord willing, uh, we'll have everything back, I'd say, in the next four to five weeks. And we are planning to leave for PNG in the next five to six weeks. So if you want to be praying for us, we have a lot to get done before we uh, step onto that plane and leave the comfort of the United States and step into the interesting, exciting, wonderful, and um, sweaty environment of Medang. So that is just a, a general update. Be, be praying about these things. Pray for our family. We would cover your prayers. Pray for the Twombly's. Uh, things that feel very comfortable for us because we've been there, uh, lived it, and done it for a duration of time. There's really not much mental energy that needs to be put towards it. We'll hop on a plane, we'll pack bags, we'll get there, it'll be sweet. Um, there's things we need to do in preparation for our time there so that it goes well. But for the Twombly's, they're feeling the nature of having to leave what they have known and step into the unknown and a lot of the concerns that can be there. So pray for them in that transition. They're telling themselves the right things. They're preaching the truth to themselves, and they have lies to step into their mind. But they need help in that, and your prayers are coveted in that. Please pray for them. Pray also for the Cans. Pray for the Mitchells, and just pray for wisdom. What I want us to step into next, having given an update, is I want us to actually take some time to look at the book of Titus. We're going to be spending time this morning in the book of Titus. And in particular, before I do that, I want to set things up so that we're able to think about ministry in Papua New Guinea generally. In Papua New Guinea, there is indigenous church planting as well as ministry that happens in Medang Town. We'll also be spending a large portion of our time considering the ministry in Medang Town in light of the book of Titus, especially chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. There are many parallels to the way things were in Crete in Paul's day, just as there are in Medang Town today. And Papua New Guinea has two prongs of ministry focus. One is the need for indigenous church planters, and this work is focused primarily in areas that we would call rural or removed from cities and towns in more jungle conditions. The church planter works to bring the gospel to people in a particular language group, and that group will typically have many separate villages contained within the language group, and the church planting team will choose to live in one of those villages to live and carry out their work. Oddly, something that is to be expected in each village of every language group is a church building. People gathering Sunday morning to listen to something being taught, and at least one copy of the Bible in the trade language, talk pisan. Something that is also to be expected is that the gospel of forgiveness of sins through faith in Christ alone will not be preached, nor will it be understood. That isn't my assessment. That isn't my summary. That isn't my observation. That is actually an assessment of interacting with New Guineans that have been saved as a result of church planters going into villages. Their assessment is, hey, Bible in front of us, people teaching, had no idea that the gospel was forgiveness through faith alone in Christ alone. No idea. You don't have regeneration, but you have people showing up Sunday morning. You have a Bible that is opened, and you have morals and ethics, and you must be these things without any means of empowerment to do them. The Cans and the Mitchells have been engaged in this prong of ministry among the Doe people in the village of Maui Roro for several years. This work is slow. It requires two to three years of focused language and culture learning before the gospel can even be preached. When the time comes for the teaching, you don't begin in the book of Romans. You begin at the beginning. Teaching goes on for weeks, beginning in the book of Genesis, ending in the New Testament, having taught over 60 plus lessons to reshape their worldview and present the gospel of Jesus Christ with clarity. You have to take everything that you learn during the two to three years of living with the people and pit the gospel against their animistic belief system of ancestral worship in their natural man-made self-righteous mindset. It's a mindset that isn't common only in P&G. It's common to everyone who does not know Jesus. Jesus. 
The focus of the work is entirely evangelistic. You're coming to the work with the expectation that the people you are living alongside of are lost. Uh, They're in need of hearing the gospel. You assume that you are the only one the Lord has brought to preach the gospel to them as God's herald. And it drives you and it presses you on to that hard work. Those moments in language learning where you're misunderstood, you don't understand a concept, you can't track the conversation. Uh, Things are hard within your home, you're navigating what you have always known and now you're in a new context and it just gets difficult. You press on. You hear the death of an individual in the village and it presses you on that the gospel has to be preached with clarity. Your aim and focus in indigenous church planting is evangelistic. By contrast, if one prong of ministry in Papua New Guinea is indigenous church planting, working in isolated rural areas, the second prong of ministry is the need for church planting and strengthening in the more urban environment of Medang Town. The focus and goals of ministry in Medang Town can be summed up really in four points. Church planting and strengthening, production of translated discipleship resources in the trade language, providing logistical and administrative support for indigenous church planters, and pastoral training for local New Guinean believers. Medang is a coastal town sitting in the northeast of Papua New Guinea on the coast, situated at the top corner of a massive bay. It's a thoroughfare of people regularly coming from the Finisterre Mountains, the Sepik in the northwest, and market trucks carrying produce and passengers from the Highlands region. Trade language of Tokpisan is your means of communication with traces of English here and there depending on the individual's level of education that you're interacting with or how many movies they happen to have watched in English. My family lived in Medang overseeing and administrating the logistical needs of the ministry in Maui Roro. We came to truly enjoy Medang Town. Our home was just one house away from the ocean, which we regularly enjoyed. We were also part of a local evangelical brotherhood church in Medang for five years, participating in Sunday morning worship, kids programs, and helping preaching uh, from time to time. So why is Titus's ministry in Crete significant as it relates to the ministry in Medang? That is the question. The state of the church in Medang is complicated. Disorder and the desire uh, to be one bell or to be unified at all costs with other individuals dominates and defines the people in Papua New Guinea. It also defines many of the churches in Papua New Guinea as well. There are Lutheran churches, Baptist churches, Pentecostal churches, a Brethren church, an Anglican church, and Roman Catholic worshipers. There are also self-proclaimed pastors and evangelists. I've listened to peddlers of special concoctions sold in old soda bottles that claim to heal any ailment that you have. I've seen New Guinean nuns and monks dressed in all the attire that would be associated with such titles. There are times when we have heard the gospel of clarity from pastors. There are other times when it was apparent that the gospel was not understood. I sat down across the table with a dear New Guinean brother who shared his testimony, explaining how the Lord had taken him out of Roman Catholic animism and saved him with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I also witnessed communion on Sunday that regularly resulted in less than half the attendants actually taking communion, no doubt due to the lack of understanding or clarity related to what communion is or a lack of understanding of what justification is, as opposed to an individual being sanctified progressively over time. I've also seen the day in and day out of living in Papua New Guinea alongside my family. The joys and delights of being in Medang Town are always coupled with regular pickpocketing, robbery of local stores, the assaulting of individuals, group retaliation to vehicular accidents or crime. I remember back in 2020, Towards the back end of our time in Medang, a local police officer being murdered in the middle of the day at a market close to our house. The family and the people associated with the police officer responded by burning down the entire market, as well as the settlement area adjacent to it. Even things that are commonly associated with delight and refreshment here in the States have to be reinterpreted. The melody of rain falling on a tin roof would always prompt joy, but it had to be coupled with a watchful eye, just in case a thief tried to break in and steal something under the cover of the rain's noise. The population of Medang Town is somewhere between 80 and 90,000 people, 
as of 2022. And just to give a comparison, uh, the town of Gilbert in 2021 has 270,000 people. But the number of issues related to law and order in Medang compared to the size of the population is staggering. So in summary, it's, it's a mixed bag. Law and order issues that impact your day-to-day -day living as well as your livelihood are there. Believers will find themselves in churches with poor shepherding or a lack of good training to make them more effective shepherds. Morals and a good past scene or a good pattern of life are more commonly preached from pulpits rather than the divine power of the gospel to save and transform the life of a sinner. Political leaders bank their efforts on laws related to social reform, attempting to correct internal issues with external regulations. Such efforts have the possibility of change, but nothing of a lasting nature. Interestingly enough, the island of Crete has similar issues in Paul's day. And it's a helpful letter for us to read and consider as we think about ministry in Medang Town. And maybe it's just an island thing. Maybe that's what it is. The island of Crete is positioned around 60 miles southeast of Greece and 110 miles southwest of Turkey. It's the largest island in the Mediterranean uh, with a width of around 160 miles, a height of 36 miles. The island is a massive mountain, Mount Ida, 9,000 feet running right through it from end to end. And the steep slope of the mountain on the south side makes habitation rather difficult, making the northern side more populous. The color of the water is the type of crystal blue we would all tend to associate with an exotic destination, much like Medang. Crete is only mentioned three times in the New Testament. Once in Acts 2.11, on the day of Pentecost. A second time in Acts 27, which records two Crete ports in Paul's journey uh, from where he was going to Rome in his imprisonment, waiting trial. And finally here in the book of Titus. The book of Titus contains helpful information regarding what we know about the people of Crete in Paul's day. And although Acts ends with Paul in Rome, it doesn't record the end of Paul's church planting ministry. In Romans 5.24, Paul mentions that he intends to pass through Rome on his way to Spain. These are the words of a free man, not a man who is waiting patiently in prison for trial. And at some point after Paul's release from prison to Rome, he made his way to Crete with Titus and possibly others. And no doubt the efforts would have been evangelistic in nature. And I would not have been surprised if they found Jewish Christians on the island who had carried the message there when they heard it back in Pentecost in Acts 2. For some reason, Paul had need to depart, left Titus to take on the responsibilities that he would have carried out. They were still there. However, he sent him a letter, in the letter of Titus, probably written sometime in between 62 and 65 AD. Titus 1.5 says this, that Paul left Titus on Crete to carry out two tasks. Let's just look at that real quick in Titus 1.5. It says, for this reason, I left you in Crete, that you would do these two tasks, set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city, as I directed you. It's fascinating that the word church, ecclesia, is never mentioned in the book, lending to the things needing to be set in order and the need for elders to be appointed in every city. This doesn't mean that there were no leaders, and it doesn't mean there were no believers there, but the letter calls them believers, we know that, but it was lacking elders, qualified men, mixed with believers to create churches in every city who were actually thriving and doing what the Lord desired for them to do. Titus had no small task. And Paul provides Titus with delegated apostolic authority to carry out what he was commissioned to do. Imagine Titus, he has the letter of his commission in his hand as he's carrying out his responsibilities on Crete. So after providing Titus with his twofold task, he goes on to list the qualifications of the elders that Titus is to appoint in every city. Then he provides a reason for the qualified elders due to the general climate of the people on the island of Crete. Uh, look down at verse 10 through 13. It says, For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision 
who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. So if there was ever a time to consider the need for clarity on carrying out church planting ministry in an environment similar to Crete, the book of Titus has those answers. How do you deal with rebellious men, empty talkers, deceivers? How do you change an evil beast through a lazy glutton? Some of whom are no doubt, no doubt very young believers in Christ. You preach and you teach and you continue to teach the gospel with clarity. This takes us to our first point. We'll read Titus 3, 1 through 7 first, and then we'll dive into the proper conduct of every believer. But let's read 3, 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to be peaceable, considerate, demonstrating all gentleness to all men. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. But when the kindness and affection of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not by works, which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that, having been justified by his grace, we would become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Notice in verse 1 that Paul charges Titus with an imperative or a command or a charge or a call to action that addresses a believer's conduct related to the public domain. This gives us our first point, the proper conduct of every believer captured in verse 1 and 2. Where now, where chapter 1 focuses on the more familial conduct expected of believers, here in chapter 3 he turns to public content and public conduct. The them here is looking back to the groups of believers mentioned in chapter 2. Older men, older women, younger women, younger men, and slaves, all given instruction in terms of godly living one to the other. Here, that same group, them, remind them what they are to be. Now, Paul's reminding and telling Titus, he needs to remind them. It's not offhand, just, hey, sit down, have a single event, remind them, then move on. No, it, this is a ongoing, durative, active reminding. He was in a pattern of reminding the people of what it is that they were to be. They were to live in a way that was conducting themselves, that was pleasing to the Lord. He gives a total of seven items that Titus was to be regularly reminding them of. And the patterns of reminding believers of truth, these aren't only isolated in Titus. These are common all throughout the New Testament. 2 Timothy 2.14, Paul says the same thing to Timothy. Remind them of these things. Find Peter in his last days, just prior to death, 2 Peter 1.12 He says, I will always be ready to remind you. Same thing in Jude 5. He says, I desire to remind you. This is just the thing that we need, a mind that is again stirred up as if a mind sitting without being reminded just sits stagnant. It is a deception that happens so commonly in my heart to think that I don't need to remember certain things or be reminded of certain things. We have to remember these things. And this was Titus's call that he needed to remind the people to do these things. The first of the seven looking down is to be submissive or subject to rulers or to authorities. The idea here is placing yourself under something. To be subject is to put yourself under And here, the rulers and the authorities speak to human offices, rulers, those carrying out the laws of the land, like a governor and like the police. 
those that are putting things into legislation and those that are actually carrying out and enforcing that which was put into place. These things are active. This was a regular pattern that they were to have of being subject to rulers and authorities and leaders. Paul uses the same phrasing in Romans 13.1. He says, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. These disobedient Cretans were to be individuals who were subject to authority. What a contrast. Second, writing on the coattails of this, they were to be obedient, also active. The pattern that they were to be demonstrating was obedience. Now imagine being submissive to an authority. I'm, gonna, I'm just, hey, I'm going to be submissive to an authority. Here comes a police officer. But then the police officer gives instruction. You are to obey it, and you're like, yeah, I'm going to throw that away. I'm not going to obey it. These two go hand in hand to be subject under and also to be obedient to are two items that shake the hand of one another. It would be impossible to separate them. So Paul merges them together. Acts 5.29 Peter states, and this is an objection to these things, but Peter states, uh, speaking to this Sanhedrin, he says, we must obey God rather than men. That same word being used there in terms of obedience. Uh, there are times I've interacted with folks that have said, well, they not, not, don't have to obey the government and everything. It's like, actually, the, this, the expectation is you do. And the exceptions are the things we find in Scripture. The apostles here being prohibited from being able to actually preach Christ, that is the thing that they rise up against and say, we must obey God in these things. But obedience to the government is the standard and the expectation. It is not the exception. Look at the third item that is here, to be ready for every good work. Every good work. These are actions. You're, you're moving yourself to actually do something that is good and beneficial and to be ready. I don't know if you have ever been to somebody's home that they invited you over for an event, but you could tell when you got there you loved them, but they just were not ready for you to show up. It's almost like things are being put into place and in order, almost like last minute. There wasn't preparation for those things. And you notice, you can see that, and you still love them. But you've also been invited to people's homes and you show up and they are ready, staged, everything prepared. You walk into each event and moment of your time together and it's seamless. It takes time and energy and focus. You have to plan to be ready. That is the goal here. That is what he's communicating. You're, you're ready, a mind that is thinking on and cultivating the ability to be ready for every good work when it shows up. This isn't reactionary. This is planned readiness to do that which is good and right. Look at the next, the fourth. To blaspheme no one. This is to slander, to revile, to defame. This is the actions of an individual um, that may actually look good outwardly, but your lips betray you later on when you speak poorly of an individual. This is getting at heart motive. Not only the things that you are doing, submissive, obedient, I'm ready for every good work, but that guy, let me tell you about that guy. You're dealing with the slandering nature of a heart against those that are over you, subject over you, or individuals that maybe do not meet your standards or your expectation of how something should have been done. Fifth here is to be peaceable. Which is interesting, because depending on your translation, you could flip it uh, a different way, and you could say this, avoid quarreling. That's another way to say it. When you see fighting and quarreling happening, there's no peace that exists in that environment, and so to be peaceable is to avoid the thing that actually fights against peace. And so he says, be peaceable. You're to be peaceable people. Titus, remind them, be peaceable. Six is this picture of being yielding or gentle is probably what you have in front of you. And far from being rebellious men and deceivers and evil beasts, Titus is to remind these believers to be entirely changed. You need to be gentle. You have to be yielding. You must be an individual who is 
One who is not sharp nor harsh. One who is approachable. Philippians 4.5, Paul writes to the Philippians saying, Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Same category. Same expectations for those in Crete as there was for those in Philippi. Same expectation that there is even for us this morning. Coming to the seventh, he says, showing or demonstrating, or you may have to show all gentleness to all men or complete gentleness to all men. This is actually a summary, a final item in the list. It's really communicating the manner of all their conduct. They are to be showing and demonstrating that their words are trying to get at the idea of the conduct that is proving your gentleness. If a person that stands, person that stands next to you or you see somebody that's interacting with somebody, but they never speak ever, you wouldn't say they're gentle. You'd say, ah, they're quiet. They just, don't, they just don't talk much. Gentleness is something that is demonstrated by your actions. Uh, you would qualify somebody as being gentle, having observed their conduct with another individual, even working through something like an argument or maybe an area of disagreement. And you'd say, man, that person is just gentle in the way that they interact. They demonstrate their gentleness even in situations that are difficult and hard. And believe me, Titus would have to step into hard conversations, demonstrating gentleness. He was the standard that everybody would look to in terms of what is it to demonstrate gentleness? Well, Titus is doing it, and he's having difficult and hard conversations with rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers. They had to be confronted. What's fascinating here is that Paul did not give the Cretans a license for their sinful patterns of behavior. He just didn't. He didn't chalk it up to cultural norms. He even quotes the cultural norm in the beginning. He doesn't say this is just the way that they are. He actually commands them with apostolic authority to change and continually practice these things as patterns of their lives. You know, there were countless times living in Papua New Guinea interacting with missionaries where they would just sum up sinful behavior as being, well, that's just cultural. That's just the way that they do that. That's just how they interact with each other. And as much as there will be categories of culture that are different and not sinful, but fall into categories of preference, many of the things that were classified as cultural were actually things that were sinful. Things that God hates, things that the Cretans were doing, things that need to be confronted and confronted sharply, but confronted with gentleness. Granted, discipleship is a process of walking alongside people as they change, and that sometimes is slow, and sometimes that is fast. Paul here goes directly to the expectation that they must change. This is just what he expected. The gospel has to change people. He just, he expected it. The call to remember these things also speaks to the fact that Paul would have been speaking about these things when he was with them prior to him leaving. Now this call to remind them of the proper conduct of every believer is not from a lack of love or from a lack of uh, assessing his own self or hypocrisy. Rather, his grounds for the change rests in the second point which is being reminded of this, point two, the former condition of every believer. Look down at verse three with me. It says, for we ourselves also once were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. Paul transitions here from what Titus is to be reminding them of to why they must do so. Prove to me why I have to live the way that you are saying, Paul. Why? Why do I have to conduct myself in a way that's peaceable? Why do I need to be obedient, to be submissive? Why? He replies and says, for or because we ourselves were once foolish. He lays out a miserable grouping of attitudes and dispositions that pattern these believers prior to their salvation. 
Notice the beginning of the verse. <laughs> Who's in the group? Look at this group. We. Paul includes himself in this list. Paul, Titus, the Cretan believers. They're all in there. And the contrast is stark. He also places a timestamp on when they were defined this way, saying once, speaking to a period of time that was in the past that does not define the present. And here he presents, in Paul's classical style, another seven patterned behaviors of this former life that they used to live in. Let's look at the first. Foolish, unintelligent, dull-witted, the past state of Paul, Titus, and Cretan believers, and by implication, us, was one of foolishness. Galatians 3.1, Paul uses the same phrase, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? There is a state of thinking for the individual who is classified as a fool where they actually think they're wise. This is the picture of anybody that is actually in their lost condition. They view their assessment of the world, their assessment of themselves, their assessment of their actions, all as good and wise and excellent. And God looks and says, foolish. Second, look down at this one with me, disobedient. Paul's already used this word in the book of Titus in 116. It says here in 116 that, they profess to know God, but by their works they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and unfit for any good work. Rather than this directly having a connotation of disobedience to God, it here has an immediate contrast to the call to submit and obey rulers and authorities. Prior to this, they were disobedient. Evil beasts. That's a horrible term. <laughs> This is a life patterned by disobedience in favor of obedience to self. Your own assessment is of the authority. Look at the third with me. It says being deceived or being misled. This is a, this is a passive statement, a passive verb. The foolish, disobedient one here finds themselves deceiving themselves by their self-loving action and also being deceived by the world's pursuits around them. It is an impossibly downward spiral of a condition. Paul uses this phrase also in 2 Timothy 3.13. He says, While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. This picture of deception is one where the individual, again, being a fool because of their own assessment of themselves, this individual is deceived and is being deceived. But here it is one that is being misled. Fourth, it says enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. This is just terminology for servitude. These are our sinful wants, our secret pleasures and uninterrupted enjoyments that give no consideration to others but only satisfy our sinful passions. The word here is literally one being epithemia, which is looking at an individual's pursuits or loves or wants. The other is actually the word for hedon, an individual who lives for pleasure and indulgence. And sadly, the pursuit of such pleasures reveal their master. Slave relationships are the result of such pursuits. And enslavement and bondage with no ability to truly change. What a contrast to what Paul calls them to be in verses 1 and 2. Be these things. Remind them of these things. You can't do any of those things if you're a slave. None of them. Look at the fifth. He says, spend one's life or carry out your life in malice and envy. The idea here is a person spending an inherited fortune on fruitless things only to find one day that every last penny is gone and you have nothing to show for it. But rather than money, it is your life that you have been spending and the things you have invested your time in has only resulted in just bitterness. Bitterness towards others, 
a lack of love towards others, hatred towards others by your actions. You've spent your life on something that is entirely fruitless. This is the condition. Six, despicable and loathsome. This is the detestable thing that you do not have any desire to be around. It's an adjective describing the individual in this condition. It's like a person who's lived a wasted life of bane pursuits. Dirty, sick, nearly unapproachable, just loathsome. An individual that you would have great aversion to approaching. This is how every person in an unsafe state is viewed in God's eyes. Just despicable, loathsome, step away from, hard to approach. Last section here. The last one he lists is hating one another. Look down at that with me. Excuse me. The pursuits of this former life can truly be summed up with the category of self-love. If you were going to summarize all of them, you could say self-love is one that sits in it. And the person viewed or viewing God's truth as foolish disobedient to authority in favor of their own, deceives themselves, and through their pursuits, finds themselves in slaves, living a life of passion, pursuing only to look back and see that all was wasted. They were defined as a detestable thing, and through this self-love could only do what? You can only hate others by their use or your use of them for your own benefit. That is what hating others is. If your focus is entirely on yourself, self-love, how do you have any room to, by your actions, love anyone else? This is a horrible condition. And although every believer may not have been as bad in one area or worse in another, it's still a horrible condition of bondage. Paul's point here is to say, how could a believer go on living as they did formerly? This is who you were. How could you continue living in that way? Friends, you and I must remember that if we are in Christ, then by implication, we were also, in fact, in that we ourselves statement. Titles do not matter here. Apostles, elders, deacons, churchmen, all who come to Christ come from this former life patterned by self-love. You come from that. I have a period in my life where I was dominated and enslaved to self-love. If you're listening to this and you don't know Christ, friend, you are still in this state. There is forgiveness available to you, though, through Christ, which moves us into the next point. We've looked at the call for godly living. We've looked at the condition of a former life, and now we turn in verses 4 through 6 to the divine work of saving the believer. It says, But when the kindness and affection of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The reminding call to godly living, which is grounded on our former condition, requires divine intervention to change each believer into a new creation. A change is introduced with the word but here, the transition from one condition to the other. Just like any great rescue mission, there's a plan. There is a means of extraction and that is put in place, and the timing of the event is prepared, and the stage is set for the rescue. Here we see not only the intervention by God to carry out his rescue plan to save the believer, but also when he did it, how he could do it, the means he used to do it, and the agents who carried it out. Notice verse 5. We're going to skip over 4 briefly. It says, He saved us. That is what is always required of a person in a state of bondage and enslavement. Always. Rescue. They must be removed from that situation, freed from that bondage, rescued from what they were unable to escape themselves. This is the change of nature. 
an extraction from the believer's previous condition laid out like we saw in verse 3. God alone had to act in this effort. He alone is the one shown here as saving. Look down at verse 4. Or look up, actually, to verse 4. To see the timing of the event. When were you saved? When the kindness and affection of God our Savior appeared. Now, if you know the Lord, consider when you realize that the gospel was true and you placed your hope and confidence to be forgiven from your sin in Jesus Christ alone. It happened when you realized what? How bad your sinful condition was in light of his kindness and his affection towards you to still forgive you. Prior to that event, the gospel was either held in obscurity or disdain or never viewed as God's kindness or affection. The word appeared here is passive, meaning a person is not working to make something appear. It just appears. It's made visible. It's made evident. You see it with clarity you didn't have prior. It'd be like a table in your mind cluttered with a thousand things related to the Bible and truth, the world, sin, the gospel, but it means nothing to you. Then one day, everything is swept off the table and sitting in the middle is the kindness and affection of God in the gospel, perfectly grasped by realizing the gospel and believing it. That is when God saved you. It was evident. It was clear. You saw it with clarity for the first time. That's when he saved you. Coming back to verse 5, notice how he was able to save the believer. It says, he saved us not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy. The contrast shown here is rather stark. In fact, in Greek, this section doesn't begin with he saved us. It begins with not by works which we did in righteousness. Not by those. He places the emphasis first on the thing that made no contribution to God's saving work. Even the best deeds or actions performed in keeping with what is right in an unsaved condition, they have no sway in how a believer is actually saved. None. This means that even in an unsaved state, people can do things that are good and helpful, but they have no merit before God. None. With clarity on what makes no contribution towards a believer's salvation, the transition but there presents how God was able to step in and save that which was loathsome. He did it not according to anything that we did, but according to his mercy. Or said another way, in keeping with or consistent with God's mercy, he saved us. He simply cannot help but be a merciful God, for that is who he is. Saving sinners who do not deserve saving is merciful, and that is the business that he is in. Next, let's peek down to the text to see the manner or the way which he performed the saving. It says, through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. I thought this was a helpful quote in a Greek lexicon. It just said, this is the bath that brings about regeneration. Obviously, it's not a physical bath. This isn't baptism in terms of cleansing the body physically. This is a bath that is one that brings about a newness of life. In fact, that word is used in one other place. It's Matthew 19, 28, describing the renewed nature of the earth during the time of Christ's millennial reign. It is a complete change of the way the believer thinks from how he formerly thought. You are born again. You are here a new creation. It required that the thing that was loathsome was washed and regenerated to actually be something that was approachable and lovely. This task of regenerating and renewing the believer is the work of the Holy Spirit himself. Look close at verse 5 into 6. It is by the Holy Spirit. It's only fitting that the person of the Holy Spirit who takes up residence in the believer should be the one who prepares and renews that space to be fit for him to reside in. Verse 6 points us to the Holy Spirit as being poured out richly. Believer, you have been richly supplied with the Holy Spirit. Every Cretan 
who put their faith in Christ, who is formerly disobedient, an evil beast, a lazy glutton, all of those things, guess what? Richly supplied with God's own Holy Spirit living in them. You don't lack a degree of him living in you that another has more of. You've richly experienced his work in your life, in your thinking, in your trials, in your joys, in your perseverance, and in your growing love for Jesus Christ himself. Section closes up saying, Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Rescuer, the one that was needed to bring us out and bring the Cretans out and bring Paul out and bring Titus out of that horrible condition. We needed that rescue. Here he is, our Savior, our Rescuer, the one who came and died and was raised. It's significant. God is called our Savior in verse 4. Now here, Jesus Christ is called our Savior. It seems like rescue and saving is something that is a priority to get us out of that former condition. This is what God does. And his son, Jesus, is the one who did the saving. The work of dying on the cross to pay for our sins, for the sins of Cretans who put their faith in him, for the sins of those in Medang that put their faith in him, for the sins of every believer everywhere. Well, as if that divine work of saving were not enough, we come to the final point. We must be reminded forth of the inheritance reserved for every believer. Look down at verse 7 with me. It says, so that having been justified by his grace, we would become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Paul opens this section with a statement, so that, is showing the intended result of God's saving work for the believer. Look down at that statement in 7. It says, having been or being justified by his grace, A statement that looks back at what we just saw in verses 4 through 6. The believer being saved and regenerated or reborn has been justified, set right, declared right in God's eyes. This is an individual who no longer is outside of the presence of God, unable to come to him. No, declared righteous. A position before God secures the intended result God had for those he saves. The text says, so that we would become heirs. Or that we might become heirs. It's not meant to communicate possibility, depending on how your translation is reading. Or the potential of a believer obtaining eternal life. No, it's, it's communicating the sure securement of eternal life that a believer presently possesses, but also anticipating that future eternal life to come. Now, an heir is one who is, who's what? Entitled to rule and authority. They may not sit in the throne or sit on it, but they look at it, and their father, the king, grooms them for that work of kinging in the future. That is an heir. It is sure. It is secured. And it is theirs by birthright. Only sons and the present ruler have such a status. The regenerating work of the Holy Spirit places believers into the position of an heir. Not of ruling, but receiving eternal life. And having the hope of that eternal life to come. So not only were you brought out of a horrible condition, redeemed, really with no effort coming from you, God alone in his kindness saved, but then also you are given entitlement that you do not deserve to obtain a gift that only belongs to God, eternal life with him in heaven forever. A believer's hope and confidence in their eternal life to come shapes the way they live and conduct themselves in this life. (laughs) How much an heir of eternal life anticipating what is to come, how is that not also to shape the way that we presently live now? Moving to close up, 
and answering the question that we asked at the beginning, how does God bring about real change in an environment like Crete, in an environment like Medang, in an environment like America? How does he handle and deal with rebellious men, empty talkers, and deceivers? How do you change an evil beast, a lazy glutton? How do you work to set in order what remains? How do you do that? Section in Titus helps us understand social reforms, new laws, and governance. Yes, they may help put things into place that would change society. But they only work to bend the present natural nature of man into conformity with what those leaders desire for things to look like. They don't change an internal issue with external implications. God completely changes the nature of those individuals through the preaching, hearing, and believing of the gospel. And he sustains that change through the ongoing work of reminding his new creatures through preaching and teaching of who they were once were and empowers them to live as they must be. This has to shape the way that we think about missions, church planting in Papua New Guinea. It has to shape that we think about living here. We have to be reminded of what God calls us to be so that we can remember who we formerly were, so that we can look at God's grace as being truly magnificent. If we do not remember and think on our past condition, we will be unable to live in a way that is perfectly aligned with what God has saved us into. So you think about this text, and as you think about it, not only apply it to your own life and check yourself in terms of following Titus's instructions to the Cretans, but also consider and think about what are the true things that actually bring about lasting change in people, and by implication, those that are around them. So I think about ministry in Medang, which is a focus that we will be stepping into when we leave here and go with the Tuamblis. We, we desire to see New Guineans in Papua New Guinea love the Lord and to conduct themselves the way that we've seen in verses 1 and 2. But you can't preach verses 1 and 2 without preaching the remainder. You can't instruct morals and good conduct unless you are actually instructing new creatures. Let me wrap us up in prayer. God, your gospel is glorious. Lord, it is the only thing that is able to take something that is an evil beast, a detestable, loathsome, unapproachable thing, and actually make that person new entirely. So that a mental disposition, a thought process, a mindset of how the life works and how that person exists in it, in a pursuit of vain pleasures as opposed to what you desire, which is a pursuit of what is right and good, all of those things can only come out of a heart that has been renewed. A heart that has been bathed in the bath of regeneration. A heart that has actually been reborn. Oh God, I pray that you would give us hearts that live in a manner that pleases you, that we would delight on the gospel as it is so glorious. And Lord, that we would live in a manner that pleases you. And I pray for all of our friends in Papua New Guinea, individuals that are laboring and ministering over there. And I pray for New Guineans. God, they are individuals who are pinched off a lump of clay just like us. Individuals that have a need for a Savior to redeem them. But Lord, they need to hear the message of the gospel to be able to believe it. They must see it for what it is, manifested and appeared before their eyes as glorious to be able to obey it. God, I praise you for your word. What clarity you give us on dealing with the heart of man in any context that we find ourselves in. Give us a love for you that only continues to grow. Remind us of these truths. In your name I pray. Amen.